Thanks for joining me today, Andy. Nice to see you. Oh, thanks for having me. It's really nice to get to meet you. Likewise, likewise. Um, so maybe just to start, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and, and also just your background and life story, whatever you'd like to share about that, anything you'd like to share at any length is, is welcome. Sure, that's uh, that's super open-ended. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm here in San Francisco. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful day. I, I'm a sort of independent researcher. Um, my background is in um, computer science and design and, and learning science, um, kind of in that order. Uh, <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I, um, I got deeply into computers, um, probably as a, as a consequence of not having um, a lot of uh, peers around that, that, that I, I felt like I could connect to. So I, um, I started making uh, you know, video games and um, kind of tools for, for other creative people when I was a kid and got more serious about it as a teenager and made a bunch of open source software. Um, I got like really into tools, like helping helping other people make stuff was was um, was really exciting to me. I went off to uh, Caltech where I studied computer science more formally, and um, it, it kind of it, it transformed a very um, like a very uh, pragmatic worldview into a I guess a, a, a somewhat more um, uh, uh, theoretical <laughs> one. So I, I, I kind of enjoyed seasoning the, the mixture that way. And um, yeah, for, from there, I, I, I went off to, to Apple, uh, where, where it seemed like that was a, a group of people making um, interesting tools for, for a lot of people. At this point, I, I didn't really have uh, much clear thinking in, in the way of, kind of telos or anything like that. I, I didn't really have like a strong sense of, of what it was that I wanted to do other than like make stuff that felt good. I had like a really craftsman like mentality about all these things. I wanted to make things that help people. I went to Apple, it was like, it was the early days of the iPhone, kind of a iOS 3 had just come out. And so it was like pretty raw. Um, the team was still relatively small, maybe a few dozen people working on the, the software at that point. And um, yeah, we, we built a bunch of stuff and um, I, I got increasingly into design um, uh, and increasingly into the, the particular branch of, of um, design systems that, that are kind of only accessible when you, when you combine um, kind of technical stuff, technical skill, technical work um, and design work in the same person. Um, you, you can see this really interesting contrast. There, there, was, there was a team there that would... Um, you know, design the operating system. And, um, yeah, this observation really launched the rest, the rest of my career. So I guess I'll tell the story. Uh, they, uh, uh, most of the team would be, would be printing out what all the different screens looked like and they put them up on the wall. And this is like a really useful thing because then you can compare, um, you can kind of make sure that there's like a consistent voice and theme. Um, but all the most interesting work was being done um, by people who couldn't print out their work. Um, because uh, it, it could it couldn't be it couldn't be flattened it couldn't it couldn't be held still it was it was kind of essentially interactive um, you know, gestures and uh, kind of physics based stuff I got really excited about um, what what this kind of dynamic computational medium could, could afford it felt like magic in my hands and and I kind of simultaneously got um, really dispirited about what we were doing with it um, so increasingly I, I got interested in trying to use this, this, this magical dynamic computational medium um, for something that, that felt more meaningful. And um, that led me to, to learning sciences. So I started doing a lot of reading in that space and in space cognitive psychology, and writing, sketching, prototyping about uh, what one might do in that space with, with this, this magical material. And uh, yeah, the, the folks at Khan Academy um, saw this work and, and reached out and um, I ended up going over there and starting kind of an uh, R and D lab with a uh, with another Apple person, uh, my designer friend Meili, and um, yeah, we worked on kind of novel learning environments for for kids. Uh, some projects for five year olds, for teenagers, um, some for uh, yeah, like kind of um, high school seniors as, as well. Um, so K twelve, and. Um, yeah, it was it was it was a, it was a delightful and, and creative time, and um, I, I became kind of increasingly um, discouraged by uh, the realities of, of K twelve education as an institution, and um, so I, I kind of uh, 
took a lot of the, the same ideas and, and have become much more excited in the past few years about applying them to, to adults and knowledge workers, um, people doing creative work and, and kind of learning and, and using their minds and, and their creative powers um, in the course of things they're really excited to do. Um, so so that's, that's, what my, that's what my research focuses on now. Um, and that kind of brings us to the current day. There's other things I could say, but I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks for that overview. Sure, um, sure. One thing I'd be curious to sort of zoom in on is you had a chance to work at two companies that I think a lot of people would really love to work at, both Apple and, and Khan Academy. I guess I guess they're te probably technically a nonprofit, right? But uh, yeah, well, nonprofit organizations are still organizations. companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Um, but anyway, I'd be curious, like, to hear kind of what your experience was working at each of those companies, and like almost what the sort of culture was like, and um, <clears throat> maybe any sharp contrast that you noticed or anything like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, ton, tons of contrasts, mm -hmm. both really interesting environments and, and both changed a great deal while I was there. I, um, I, I stayed kind of a while at, at both places. So, mm -hmm. so both grew a great deal. Um, Apple is, is, is a massive company. And one thing that, that's kind of interesting about it is that um, uh, because there's these, these very intentional barriers um, in lines of communication, the experience differs enormously depending on like the team that you're, you're working on, what, what, what thing you're working on. Um, and at the, the start of the time I was there working on the iPhone was you know, kind of understandably um, a very exciting and dynamic place uh, to be. Um, one thing I, I really liked about it that, that I think is kind of undervalued in, in tech is that, um, you know, I was working with a lot of people in, in their 50s and, and even early 60s. Um, that's really unusual. Um, you may, you'll maybe find that at Google, um, but you know, for, for the most part, tech is kind of like a young person's game, and, and there's even some skepticism of, of working with older people. Uh, but gosh, <laughs> they were really very good. They had decades of experience, and it showed. Um, this was true both in engineering and in design, and of course in marketing and business stuff as well. So um, I, I was really grateful to learn from these you know, kind of graybeard type people and it, it, it like really accelerated my work. Um, I learned a lot about craftsmanship at Apple. There's a, there's a fun story. Um, I, I hope, hope you haven't heard me tell before. Uh, I'll share that when I, when I arrived, um, I, was, I was feeling kind of intimidated because I, I, I was like by a large margin, the youngest person on this team and um, and so I felt even weirder about um, noticing on everyone's desks this object that that looked really unrecognizable, and it felt like kind of stupid to ask about it. But you know, when I finally did, this, this weird black object on everyone's desk was identified as a jeweler's loop. Um, and they said, like, oh, we we need that in order to see the pixels. Like, to zoom way in on the screen and make sure that each pixel is kind of in its place. And that that totally knocked me on my butt. Um, I've been doing software stuff my whole life, my whole young life at that point. I'd never heard of anyone doing that. Um, but, but it's really uh, exemplary of the, the, way that they, the way that they think about things. And, and actually that loop turned out to be really helpful. <laughs> and there was kind of experience after experience that, that felt that way. Um, craftsmanship, craftsmanship. Now I've kind of pulled back on the craftsmanship stuff. Um, so I'm more focused on, uh, I guess, novelty and theory and, and, and other elements, but it was really valuable. I could tell stories about Apple all day, but I'll, I'll pause there. <clears throat> Khan Academy is a nonprofit, uh, and that, that creates a lot of interesting dynamics. Um, uh, For-profit corporations are, are often influenced by um, by, by business strategy. <laughs> That's a totally empty statement. Um, yeah, but, but it'll mean like you know, the, the creative folks that, that you have in, in a little cage there might... Um, uh, what they want to make might not make sense for the business, and um, you know, non nonprofits have something analogous. I, I think um, you know it's easy to imagine that, that it's sort of like an idealistic world where you kind of like make what's right, um, but in practice, like uh, you know, nonprofit organizations answer to people; they're just different people. So rather than like a big pool of customers, you kind of answer to. It depends on the way you found the nonprofit. Khan Academy was funded by um, <clears throat> mostly by a relatively small number of large dollar, um, large philanthropic donors. And, um, and so those donors had outsized influence in a way that was pretty surprising to me. Um, they mostly tend to become from a, a business background. And so they were very interested in, in things like, you know, metrics and things going up and to the right. Um, but it was also fascinating um, how normal a nonprofit could be made to feel. 
you kind of expect it to be this like um, really bare bones, scrappy, unorganized thing, or like maybe I might expect that, but like actually no, you know, it still has like normal corporate structures and like people get salaries. They're like, you know, maybe lower than they would be in a for-profit world, but like it, there's actually like a lot of mundanity uh, about working in a nonprofit. The main thing is mostly that like um, every everyone is there for mission reasons. Like you know, anybody working in a nonprofit, <clears throat> they're taking a huge pay cut. So um, that like really skews the pool um, in a way that's that's pretty interesting. So the nonprofit has to find ways to like compensate its employees um, with things other than uh, pay, and, and they do this through mission, um, but they also do it through maybe like maybe employees have more of a voice than they would in a for profit organization. There's, there's like a lot of subtle things that nonprofits try to do. Um, what are some qualities from your time at each of those companies that you think you've taken into your work now? Yeah, so I mean, I, I mentioned craftsmanship from Apple. That's, mm -hmm. that's probably um, that's probably the biggest one from Apple. Um, Apple's, of course, kind of where I learned to, to do design work, and, and, and that's essential to my present work as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at Khan Academy, um, I'm not sure that I that I carry with me. Um, there's a scrappiness that I associate with, especially the, the first couple of years I was there at Khan Academy that, that I kind of carry with me. Um, but it, it's Khan Academy is, is much more pragmatic than I am. <laughs> it's very outcome oriented. Mm. Um, sensibly, right? that's, that's, that's not a judgment. Um, and so I, I don't actually carry philosophically that much from it. Um, of course, it's the context in which I, I learned everything that I, I know now about, you know, learning science and cognitive psychology. And, and so that's, that's valuable. I carry that with me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, you mentioned that while you were there, you kind of became discouraged by the K through 12 system. And, and could you tell me a little bit about what you found or saw that made you feel discouraged by that? Sure. I mean, you know, we could talk for hours about that. Uh, <laughs> people, have people have written books about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I'd read those books um, before I joined Khan Academy. And I, I kind of understood some of the challenges, but, but I thought I could maybe figure some things out despite that. Um, but there's a lot of ways we, we could talk about this. I'll, I'll, I'll list a few. Um, one challenge, it's very concrete, is that uh, it's very difficult to get clear signal on, on one's research ideas. So my, my team was developing these kind of new ways to learn that, that were ideally um, a lot more intellectually and creatively engaging for students, um, hopefully more personally rewarding. Uh, we were kind of following a, an ethos that was interested in enabling students to uh, kind of pursue their own creative and intellectual projects using the things that, um, that they might be learning in that setting. And um, <clears throat> so you think like that this would be great and exciting and so on, but you know, in practice, we'd go into a, a classroom and, um, you know, the students had like already decided they didn't want to be there. So like we might be bringing, uh, you know, some, some really interesting, uh, exciting, creative new environment, but um, the students were so often already like really quite checked out. Um, they, they'd already like really formed opinions um, that, that made it very difficult to learn. Um, so practically speaking, hard, hard to do iterative research in that context. Of course, we could go to like um, special lab schools, like Khan Academy actually had a lab school where the students aren't like that. Um, but then those students are weird. And so like, you, you don't quite know uh, <laughs> what, uh, how much you should trust what you're observing. Um, and, and more broadly, like what I just described is indicative of um, challenges in, in this space, institutionally, culturally, socially. Uh, so, so for instance, like we understand that um, in mathematics, for instance, many students learn to perform procedures and operations, uh, but they don't really understand any of what's going on. Um, and so like, maybe we think that's bad, maybe we don't. Like, I, I personally think that's kind of bad. Um, Common Core is... Um, many things, but one thing that it is, is an ambitious effort to correct this. Uh, so parts of the standards 
really shift focus towards understanding um, in a real way. And, and, and the trouble is, the trouble exists on many fronts. Um, there are parents who um, see their kids doing math in a way that's different than they did as a kid. And they feel many things. Um, they may feel that their kid isn't being pushed as hard as they were when they were a kid. They may feel threatened by the fact that they don't understand their kid's homework, uh, so they can't help them. Uh, the teachers um, are often in a position where their mathematical background doesn't actually prepare them to have like a, like a understanding oriented conversation about mathematics. Not, not all of them, absolutely. I mean, uh, it, it's really a relatively small fraction who really struggle in this way. But um, one of the problems with the rollout of Common Core has just been um, teacher facility. Uh, and then um, administrators have this interesting incentive issue where um, the, the tests which assess their success as kind of institution builders, um, <clears throat> those tests still emphasize procedural skills. And so um, no, nobody's really incentivized to be the first mover. And so in the 15 years that have followed Common Core's uh, kind of introduction, and, uh, yeah, the, the tests are now slowly moving in this direction. And, and so the, the other forces can kind of move this way too. But um, this, these, gears, these gears are not well greased. Um, and so doing things in this space requires confronting the, the many participants in the space um, for, for good and for ill. <clears throat> the parents, the teachers, the administrators, the community, the downstream um, consumers. So, so often challenges in this space will arise when you think about uh, college admissions and, and employment. Uh, at the Khan Academy Lab School, it was kind of the joke that, um, you know, kids would be doing all this like intellectual and creative freedom stuff and th their minds would be like really expanded and it was great. Uh, and then the parents, the parent-teacher conferences would say like, but my kid's still gonna get to Stanford, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Hmm. Did you did you work personally at that school? I was not an employee of the lab school, but my team mm -hmm. would go down there fairly regularly to to test prototypes and stuff with those kids. Hmm. What was that like for you? Oh, it, you know, it's delightful interacting with children. Uh, their their minds uh, work so differently, and, and these children in particular were a delight because. Um, <laughs> happiness had not yet been beaten out of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, for the most part, they were really quite pleased to be there uh, and, and really quite intellectually engaged. And, and this is, of course, both a, a function of a huge selection pressure and also the, the good job that this um, school with its um, talented people and, and a large budget could achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, had, we had a great time. Um, the, the challenge for, for my team interacting with this school was, was really... Um, like I said before, when we learn things from these students, what should we take from that exactly? Hmm. Hmm. What were some of the kinds of things you would uh, test during your research when you were working with these kids? Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one example of a thing we worked on was uh, a system for, for kind of open-ended problems in, in online learning systems. So. Um, a system like Khan Academy and you know, Coursera and Udacity, these systems for the most part, their, their form of practice that they offer is um, they're kind of multiple choice can give you feedback on really readily. Um, and that applies both to the, the feedback mechanism and also kind of to the nature of the question. Because you, you have to be kind of doing an activity, doing the problem where, um, there's kind of like one right way to do it, uh, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's that's the kind of problem which um, which is amenable to this kind of machine feedback, machine grading. And, and this this is not completely universal. For for instance, in like computer programming classes, you'll sometimes uh, find systems where, like, the system will grade what your program does, but you can do it any number of ways. So like there's kind of tricks you can you can do to make problems more open-ended, but very generally speaking, you know, online learning um, problems are, are kind of quite, uh, quite closed. And um, this, you know, maybe, maybe works if what you wanna teach people is like how to multiply two two-digit numbers together, um, but it, it doesn't work so well if you want, well, just very broadly for the liberal arts, it, it works quite poorly. 
Um, it also works quite poorly for, for many kinds of mathematical reasoning. But a, a question that we, we used a lot just as a, as a fun example is like, what, what was the most important cause of World War I? Um, and like, what's fun about this question is that it's, um, it's what instructional designers call an essential question. What that means is um, it, that's a question that is alive for professionals in this discipline today. Uh, there isn't an answer. You, know, you can spend your whole life answering this question. And there's lots of questions like this, and these are often the, the most fruitful ones to, to dig into. Once, once you have enough kind of core knowledge to, to do that, you know, I, I, I don't want to pretend that you could you know, spend your entire um, life only thinking about these questions. But anyway. My, my, my team uh, worked on a, a kind of online learning system that worked for this kind of activity um, rather than for, you know, kind of multiple choicey stuff. And um, yeah, we'd go down there with those kids and, you know, get their ideas about uh, historical cause and effect. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, the, the system we'd made had them kind of engage with each other as, as a form of, of peer learning and, and, and feedback. Um, not like grade each other, but um, riff on each other. And um, yeah, it's really, really fun to watch that energy. And of course, we, we learned a lot um, that, that helped us improve this environment as well. It's really interesting to hear about. And uh, yeah, I just think there's a lot of, um, I don't know, like your research is available online and people can go read about, but I think there's there's so much value in just like hearing you describe it kind of. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, like the tone that you use and the memories. And yes, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to hear about. So thank you for sharing. Um, can you tell me kind of, um, about you know your more recent career as kind of an independent researcher and, and you know there's been a number of projects that you worked on yourself and then I think Michael Nielsen is also a collaborator of yours that you've worked with pretty closely it seems can yeah, you tell me yeah. kind of about the arc of your own independent research and the different projects you've worked on over the years sure yeah so it's, it's been a couple of years now um mm -hmm. it's 2019 uh, early 2019 that I, I went uh indie uh -huh. uh, so uh yeah I mean um the, the, the broad arc of, of this research is, is we, we can kind of summarize it as, as one big project. And that's been a, a project to try to uh, augment human memory and attention, um, which sounds really abstract. So, so I, I often begin describing this by, by asking um, like, what comes after the book? And, and why are all the answers to this question that people give so boring? Like, <laughs> our answers so far seem to be things like pictures of pages of books and like videos of people like giving lectures. And I think the, you know, we, we, we could leave aside, leave, leave aside the, the efficacy of these answers. They, they just seem really boring. Like where are all the powerful ideas from, from psychology and sociology, game design and all kinds of other interesting things. So I, I, I like bringing some of that energy in, into these places. And uh, Michael and I uh, were both very interested in um, in a, in a particular phenomenon that makes it very cheap for people to remember things um, if they do a particular practice. And, and we wondered whether we could help a lot more people do that by creating kind of a new medium that, that, that integrates this practice. Um, and, so and that's space repetition it. specifically that you're just alluding to. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, the, I, I guess I should qualify that. So, so let me summarize really quickly. Space repetition is, is, is kind of like a, an automation of um, a thing that you would naturally experience uh, in the course of remembering something well. Like if you reflect, you'll, you'll often find that when you remember things well, it's because um, they've been reinforced several times after you learned it. Um, and uh, um, you kind of need reinforcement less frequently uh, uh, the more times you're reinforced. And so there's kind of a way of systematizing that. But one of the other kind of unusual beliefs that Michael and I had about this was that um, this technique has been applied almost exclusively to what we might call rote learning. So things like uh, uh, language learning, where you need to learn a lot of vocabulary. That's like 90% of the use of this. And, um, and then like the rest would be things like um, anatomy, like, you know, label this part of the human body, very popular for medical students, you know, pharmacology, like what are the effects of this, this drug? Um, so really like rote stuff um, feels very flashcardy, but we had this belief uh, that we'd experience in our own lives. They actually can use the same techniques to learn quite abstract conceptual topics really deeply. And so we wanted to test that um, on uh, quite an abstract <laughs> conceptual topic, like quantum computation. Uh, we made like this quantum computing textbook um, called Quantum Country that, that, uh, that integrates these, these, these ideas from spaced repetition, makes it really easy for, for people to... Um, 
to try this stuff out without needing a, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of skills about uh, how to how to how to write these prompts effectively, which which turns out to be hard to do. Um, and so, uh, part of my research that the past couple of years has been uh, <clears throat> uh, treating readers of Quantum Country as guinea pigs in, in, a, in a large experiment. You know, different readers are are getting different versions of Quantum Country. Oh wow! Uh, and and by doing that, I, I can um, I, I can uh, see things about the way that they remember and learn the material, um, and and hopefully uh, glean things about how people in general remember and learn material. And there's, there's generalization problems here, you know, the kind of people who read quantum computing books and, and also to what extent does quantum computing learning you know, generalize to other stuff? These are good questions. So one of the other things I've been doing is um, kind of trying to generalize this technique to, uh, to other kinds of texts, um, papers and informal articles, uh, reference material, encyclopedia articles. And um, those experiments have gone less well uh, in interesting ways, which, which are kind of teaching me how the, how the medium wants to evolve. Hmm. Um, so then that, that stuff is kind of part of this, this project I call Orbit. Um, but um, it, it's really, it's all under this, this umbrella of kind of helping people, helping people in, internalize what, what they read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, am I right in understanding that Orbit is intended to be kind of a generalized infrastructure for the kind of thing you did with Quantum Country? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's that's a, a good way to understand it. Um, I, I have, and this is a little harder to articulate. Um, uh, there are other things that I want to do with it, um, mm. and and that I do do with it personally, um, but which I haven't quite figured out how to adapt into media form. I guess I'll speak about this briefly. Um, so space repetition is is this way that you can um, kind of come back to something you learned over and over again and reinforce your memory. And that's useful when you want to remember stuff, you want to internalize it. Um, but um, that, that general idea of kind of coming back to something again and again and, and engaging with it, it doesn't have to be for memory purposes. Um, that's actually why I called it orbit. Uh, this idea that you can, you can bring stuff into your orbit. You can kind of take something you find beautiful or compelling or curiosity provoking um, and kind of tie a lasso to it and, and bring it into your orbit. I, I find it really beautiful. And just a few examples of how I did this personally. Um, you know, if someone says something in conversation to me that really stops me in my tracks and makes me reconsider, it's interesting to um, re-expose myself to that observation, you know, maybe a month later, a couple of months after that, and ask myself like, ooh, how does, how does this sit with me now? Like, have I, have I actually internalized? This thing, like, are, are there, you know, new instances that it applies to, um, or if I, I have a really um, beautiful experience, or I, I see some really beautiful uh, art that someone has made uh, to bring that back into my life and allow myself to you know, reconsider it and see what new thing I notice uh, uh, over time. Kind of, it, it, it extends my relationship with the thing temporally, and it um, it changes my emotional relationship with it as well. Hmm. Hmm. Um, what are, you know, part of the reason I've, I've been interested in spaced repetition for some time, and I read the Wired article a long time ago about Peter Wozniak, and uh, that was really inspiring. And, you know, certainly a lot of how I actually have used it has been Anki. And then it's like, mm, yeah, I think you pointed out that there, it's like hard to prompt, uh, to structure these prompts well. And that was certainly... Yes. Like people, for example, have all these like decks you can download. And it's like, well, they're poorly structured. And then also they, they're they not yeah. information that you already know. But yep. um, what are some of the kinds of things that you've seen in the field that are like problems with the sort of status quo of how space repetition is implemented? Oh, sure. Yeah, so you, you, you've named some really important ones. Um, so uh, I think a, a first problem uh, I alluded to earlier is it's just that people don't really understand the scope of the thing. Mm. Um, so I think it's mostly I think it's mostly misused. It's used for you know like learning capitals of countries and kind of boring things that that people don't like really deeply care about. They feel like they should know it or like maybe it's fun to you know, learn this trivia. Um, so I think that's a shame. Uh, but you know th there's a bunch of people who really do use it for for more serious stuff. And you know maybe they'll make these decks like you alluded to and like why is it that you can't just download that deck and you know why doesn't it 
work, um, quantum country was kind of trying to answer that um, or, or develop some theories around that. Um, one thing that you'll notice about these decks as you download them is that um, it's, it's like you, you've gotten like a shoebox of flashcards and they're, they're, they're totally fungible with, with one another. Like you could, you could shuffle their order. They're, they're not part of any kind of larger structure. Um, and in fact, Anki's going to shuffle them as it, as it shows them to you. And so um, everything that you need, or it has to be the case in, in this regime that, that everything you need in order to engage with these cards and, and really internalize them kind of exists on each individual card and they can be shuffled however they like and, and, and have to still work. Uh, and in practice, that's just really very difficult to do. Um, as, as you alluded to, these the systems mostly work by reinforcing um, stuff that is already active in your mind. Um, they, they work by um, um, consolidating uh, the, the, the memory encodings that you already have and possibly by, by adding some additional um, connections. Um, and, uh, and so if, if you don't already have this stuff active in, in some kind of structured fashion, th these things have less to reinforce. And they tend to um, both not work all that well, but, but also not be emotionally engaging because uh, it kind of just feels like you're, you're like reviewing stuff that you don't really deeply understand. And so what we've experienced with quantum country and, and this new medium so far that's been kind of interesting is uh, we're kind of playing with this theory that if, if you introduce a bunch of ideas in a narrative, um, that narrative as a structure, it has an arc, it has a linearity, it has an order. Um, and so you can kind of pause intermittently and, and ask these prompts, which are potentially unordered, um, but which are associated with this stuff that you just read and that you have fresh in your mind. Uh, and now these prompts, um, they don't really work on their own. Like if you just downloaded Quantum Country's prompts, even though they're expert written, um, th it, that wouldn't be enough. They wouldn't work, I think. Um, we should run that test actually, uh, but, but I don't think they'd work. Uh, I think they work because they are, um, they, they are an anchor to, or they're, they're like, um, they're a pointer to the, the passage, the prose passage that they, that they follow. Hmm. Um, there's like a lot of other uh, problems with, with space repetition memory systems. Um, like, oh gosh, there's so many. Uh, here's another fun one. Um, this is a design problem I've spent a while thinking about. Um, feeling a sense of progress in these systems is really hard. One key reason for that is that if these systems are working, you're going to spend almost all of your time reviewing prompts that you're bad at and that you can't remember mm -hmm. <laughs> because that, that, that's like the definition of them performing efficiently. Um, and so when I interview people and ask them to characterize like how they think they're doing memory wise, their answers, like, I can see their data. Like I know how their memory is doing and their answers are totally uncorrelated with it. Wow. <laughs> like they think they're doing terribly and like they're, they're not learning anything. It's like, maybe it's working. Maybe I'm learning a little bit. Um, but that's because they're spending all their time doing the stuff that, um, that they have trouble remembering. So we have to create like new representations of the progress or, or otherwise deal with them. Um, yeah, deal with this problem. Hmm. And it seems I have like a collection of, uh, I have a collection of like dozens of these problems here. We yeah. Just, go enjoy. <laughs> totally. Yeah, it seems like it's pretty common. I know for myself and other people that have explored them, like it's pretty common to develop like almost like an emotional resistance to doing it or a dislike or it just feels heavy or not enjoyable. Yeah. And uh, that seems like, like kind of a major problem that's sort of related to but consequent from what you're talking about. It's just like discouraging to be uh, having these like random sequence of facts that you don't remember that well, like presented. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, and that, that you maybe aren't that actually that interested in. Right. Uh, like a, another interesting design problem with these systems that, that I've spent some time uh, working on is that uh, uh, they, they, they make deleting stuff or skipping stuff or like snoozing stuff, you know, whatever verb you want to use, the exceptional case. Mm. Uh, but I, I think like when, when a, for me, when something gets up to like a one year interval and it comes back around, there's like a one in three or higher chance that I don't really care about that anymore. Mm -hmm. And like, it really is best for me to not see that again. Totally. Yeah. For me, it, when I have used them in the past, I found it essential that it like has to be stuff that um, is actively related to a goal that I actively have something that I 
specifically care about. And if it's yeah, a fact that I don't care about, even if I know it, even if I learned it in the past, it's like, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's actually a large, a much smaller subset of, of information than like you possibly could fit into space repetition of the things that you learn or are exposed to or whatever. It's like, is this actively related to my goals and direction in life basically? Right. Yeah. What are some challenges that you've found from implementing your own systems with quantum country and orbit? Like it, it seems like you were, especially with orbit, you were maybe having some difficulties that you didn't expect. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's great. I mean, you know, the, the, the nature of these things is, uh, <laughs> you know, you run experiments and, and, and they teach you where you're wrong. Like that's, right. uh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, right. So, so uh, I, I would say like the, the, the biggest, uh, the best way to summarize what, what I've learned by trying to expand this to other places is that um, you need to find a way to balance the um, expressive agency of the author and the reader and quantum country had this easy because it's a primer. And so what that means is that we can assume that if you're reading this, you don't really know anything about this stuff. And you also don't really have strong opinions about what you like the subtopics you do and don't want to learn because you're clueless. Um, so you kind of want someone to spoon feed you. And um, you're not reading tactically. That is like, you probably don't have like an active creative project going on that um, you like want to learn the stuff that specifically reinforces that because like you don't know enough about the field to have an active creative project about it. So all these things um, make it so that for quantum country, um, re like reader agency is fairly low. Like the, the reader's kind of on, on along for the ride uh, and, and the author who's a deep expert um, is going to like suggest what you should learn and how you should learn it and how you should practice and so on. And that doesn't sit well with people uh, when they're reading, you know, like a, um, an essay uh, or like a, like a general, a general uh, audience essay, or um, if you're reading a Wikipedia article, you know, um, 10 different people reading that article are going to want to know 10 different things from it. Or if you're reading an academic paper where in many cases, um, what you want to take away is more about how that paper connects to your own ideas and your own research rather than like what it is that the experimenters found. Um, so the, the, the synthesis from all of this is that the, the medium needs to um, make it easy to take advantage of the work that the author has done to interleave um, these, these memory supports, but it needs to um, be quite responsive to axes of readers level of level of prior experience, um, the specific subset of the of the piece that they they are interested in, and the depth to which they want to internalize this piece. So quantum country kind of had it relatively easy because it was like a primer for a specific topic that you could have like an expert curated uh, guide through and then if you're adapting that to other things, uh, I don't know, like, like, for example, I've been learning Tai Chi a lot in the last year. And like, if, if you wanted to adapt it to that, it's like, I'm at a specific level, specific skill, yeah. a specific form, like the things that I might yeah. want to learn or remember would be different than someone else. That's right. And, and also like, you're advanced enough to have opinions about mm -hmm. like where you want to go. Like you have maybe your own goals. You have like a way that you think about things also. So you might be resistant to um, repeatedly practicing uh, uh, an idea expressed that like was slightly misaligned from the way mm -hmm. that you think about that idea. It would feel mm -hmm. like a friction. Um, yeah, so that's been a very interesting learning and, and also like a fun design challenge. And it may be that, so, you know, I'm trying stuff to deal with this, but it may be that we come out the other side and, and we find that actually like this, this medium idea, it really, um, it, it only works well for primers. Um, mm. and, and that would be fine if, if we found that. Um, uh, it, would, it would still be valuable, I think. But um, yeah, you know, I'll go ahead and see, see how it might want to evolve to other contexts as well. Hmm. What are some of the things that you're trying as you are experimenting with that? Yeah, uh, it's a, a little difficult to talk about without <laughs> uh, you know, drawings and renderings and stuff. But um, yeah, so, so like the, the obvious dumb thing to do is like, you can, you can just show people the prompts that the author wrote and let them pick which ones they want to remember. Hmm. Um, the problem with this is like, 
the first chapter of quantum country has 112 of these prompts wow. and you do not want to make 112 decisions uh -huh. um, it doesn't feel like it has 112 prompts because like you only do one action with each prompt it's like did i remember that did i not remember that and it's like this very linear stack um, and, and there also aren't meta decisions. There's no executive control involved. Like the thing feeds you a card and you try to remember it. And then you say whether you remember it or not, you don't have to decide, do I care about this? Which is a different kind of question. Hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, so the easy way doesn't really work and, and you have to do clever things at this point. So like an example of a clever thing that you can try is um, uh, uh, for, for something like a, an essay, uh, like like an essay I've been working with is uh, Danella Meadows um, wrote this great book called Thinking in Systems, and there was an essay that that kind of prompted this book um, called like Places to Intervene in a System. It's a great essay. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely essay. Um, so <clears throat> thinking about this essay, one way that you could express your interest is um, kind of at the paragraph or subsection level. You could say like ah like. The ideas in this paragraph were particularly interesting to me, or the ideas in this subsection were particularly interesting to me. And now we're not choosing on a prompt by prompt basis. We're we're kind of doing some bulk operation here, which maybe would get refined through like successive uh, successive interactions and triage. Um, another way that you could imagine this working is um, on, on something like Wikipedia. Uh, granularity at the paragraph level would probably be inappropriate. More likely like our world in data, for instance, um, more likely it's like you found a specific fact really striking and you're like, wow, I cannot believe that like poverty has fallen, you know, in this way. Uh, and you know, like point to that specific line, you know, maybe, maybe you can do that. Uh, yet another approach that I'm trying is um, something that feels a little bit more like uh, Google Docs comments, you know, hmm. you have these, these things kind of floating in the sidebar. You know, it's, it's tough, like um, it's very distracting as a reader, your, your eyes kind of flitting back and forth and you're kind of being asked to make all these decisions about what to take and what not to take. Um, so yeah, there's some other, <laughs> other approaches I'm trying to, but this kind of gives a flavor. Hmm. This is reminding me of a, a project I've worked on, I've worked on for several years that's um, called the Digital Productivity Coach. And it's uh, something I built with my friend James and it's like, uh, basically we, we, we developed like a skill tree for productivity skills and then built a notion website around it of like, it basically has a quiz. It's like, okay, what skill level are you at now? And then it gives you a specific thing to work on for that skill level. And that does, it doesn't have any aspect of spaced repetition, but it has this sort of aspect of like a skill tree and someone's right. like interest level and that kind of thing. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's interesting in the learning sciences, that there are whole subfields that are like super laser focused on this question of like, you know, how do we get people to their learning edge? Mm. Like how, do, how do we like form a model of what people know and do not know and provide like the optimal intervention? Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. and this is like a, a very interesting research question. Uh, I, I tend not to like the answers very much. Mm. Um, it I, seems I hard to generalize. Like, it's, it's, yeah, actually that has been one of the problems. Uh, one of the things that's been very frustrating for the members of that field um, like actually there's several such fields, but one of the ones uh, that, that I'm, I'm thinking of now is called intelligent tutoring systems, is that um, there are examples of intelligent tutoring systems that are extremely successful, um, but all of the efforts to uh, you know, kind of assembly line this. So like, why don't we just like cover all of K-12, but these systems have really failed. Like it, it costs a couple of PhDs usually uh, to, to build one of these things that works okay. okay. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, okay, you, you burn through a few dissertations and you, you get like a decent instance of like this particular subtopic of this particular grade. Uh, <laughs> it's a shame that, uh, that, that it's hard to do. But even another way to look at that is like, well, you know, there aren't that many topics in the K-12 curriculum. Like maybe we just burn, you know, 500 or a thousand dissertations and we get there. <laughs> mm. uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you know the the other part of your work that you're that you're well known for is, is sort of your work with your note taking system and you know what's become <laughs> what I guess you called evergreen notes. Can can you tell me about how you started developing that system for publishing your notes and and tell me more about that? Sure. Um, as to how it started, uh, this memory system stuff and this idea of staying in contact with ideas over time, like these are just instances of kind of an umbrella that I'm very interested in, which is like computer supported thinking. 
um, if, if you go back to the early kind of uh, man computer symbiosis kind of cybernetic style um, papers that, that so much of my milieu is inspired by, uh, they're very interested in, in, the, in these kind of fundamental, almost computational questions of like, what are the limits of human cognition and capacity? What are those bottlenecks? Can we characterize them? And then in what ways can computation overcome those limitations? So like, to the extent that we believe working memory is an important limitation, um, to what extent can computers be adjuncts in that regard? And uh, um, I've been very interested in, in the research around like what is creativity actually? And like, where do ideas come from? And so, so my, 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 my practice is, is sort of, um, is a way of poking at some of those ideas and, and try, trying them on for size. Um, it's, it's not a, um, I, I would say it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of like a, a secondary research project insofar as I'm not, I'm not like running any experiments on this or, or like really, I think forming any durable generalizable knowledge, but I'm trying to, trying to get the flavor of something one way I articulate the something is how do I make how do I make work on ill-defined problems accrete day over day? Like when, I, when I'm working on quantum country, that even that's too specific. When I'm working on like helping people internalize what they read more easily, um, I, ideally I have some like new thoughts about that every day, or like I make some progress of some kind. Um, and how exactly does that accumulate into like a broader theory or a framework or um, big ideas, you know, wh whatever you might want. I've noticed that um, most knowledge workers have this, this um, th their work tends not to accrete very well. Uh, they'll, they'll spend most of their days, um, it, insofar as they're writing, they're writing like in emails or in um, maybe the context of like the, a, a specific project proposal document that they're commenting on or, or something like this. It, these are all kind of um, point samples in time and they will only accumulate in so far as the experience of you know, writing a comment on that project brief changes the way that you think about the topic so that you, when you come back to it next time, you, know, you, you, you do a different thing. Um, and, and I'm sure like, that happens. People people do think differently as they do this stuff over time, but but it, it doesn't feel great. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's working all that well. So uh, anyway, I've been thinking about these things for a while. I I read about commonplace books and Zettelkastens and tiddly wikis and personal <laughs> wikis and um, all of that stuff was kind of roiling around in my head. And as I as I kind of ran various experiments uh, in this space, and like evergreen notes are are it's kind of only one kind of thing that I do uh, in order to try to achieve what I'm gesturing at. Hmm. It seems like there are a few things that were really significant about that project from just from an outside view of, of like, well, one, that, that the notes were public. Two, I think people were really admiring the design skill and the craftsmanship, as you say, behind like mm. the the like sliding panes, and that's been adopted elsewhere <laughs> in other UIs. And um, <laughs> but it seems uh, like another really core part of it was something like uh, the notes seem to be structured around like thesis statements, basically, of like yeah, like like a, almost like a paragraph level thesis statement. Like here's a thought that I have, and then they're interconnected at that level. So rather than being like uh, associated around a specific topic or a specific person, it's more seems to be more focused around a thesis. Is um, is that true? And 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 how would you describe the thinking behind that? Yeah, that's been. <laughs> uh, I I don't feel that I've made that many contributions in this space <laughs> relative to the prior art, um, <laughs> but that's one one that that has served me really quite well, um, and that I feel was kind of missing. Uh, you know. Not, not only have you have you characterized that correctly, but but it's it, it's almost um, it, it's it's almost even a little more than that. It's it's like um, it's like an underlying force or like an underlying um, reward function that get gets optimized. Is like the the more that I can write a title that expresses a, a very like crisp uh, 
stance or claim or question or something along these lines, uh, the further along the idea is, mm. you know, uh, um, and and so I, I um, the way that I have my mind structured now is that, um, yeah, it's almost like a kind of gravity, like at all times, as I'm grappling with ideas, I'm kind of trying to get closer to being able to write that idea in sharp claim or sharp question, sharp something mode, um, because that that feels like progress. Um, and when I have when I have a bunch of those things, that's when I can start to um, kind of make argument maps and um, syllogisms and um, see where things fit together. And before that point, it feels much more um, like working memory. Like one way to view this is as a kind of chunking. Um, I, I don't know if that term is familiar, mm -hmm. psychology. Yeah, um, once I'm able to really distill a particular direction of thought down to like a single phrase, mm -hmm. um, now I can think in terms of that phrase. And there's dangers to that, of course, like uh, reality is fractal and, and often the phrase loses some nuance. So, you know, you kind of have to move up and down the, the ladder. Um, but being able to move up a level of abstraction is, is often a very powerful move and it lets you see things that you couldn't see when you were more in the details. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's funny that the design thing has been so influential. I don't actually think it's all that well in, uh, implemented, uh, all that well executed. I did it in a weekend. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I, it kind of it kind of makes me. Uh, 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 I, I I feel like I want to come back and do a real job at some point. <laughs> mm -hmm. I imagine people would love it if you did. But um, you know, I, I, I imagine um, I sort of have. Are you familiar with wordly mapping at all? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, just, it seems like you had something that was kind of in the like Genesis custom side and like, yeah, there could be like a <laughs> yeah. more productized developed version of it at some point, but you, you're kind of developing a thing on your own, so. I am, you know, uh, from my perspective, it's delightful that it got ripped off so much because mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to productize mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like this. Like, That's this not your focus. Great. I get, no, no, yeah. I mean, uh, there, and there are all kinds of questions that need to be answered. If you do want to productize something like this, there's problems to be solved. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't care about those problems. So <laughs> this is great. We, we can have division of responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Uh, I, I imagine that, um, well, yeah, just coming back to the point about theses, um, in some ways it, it seems pretty straightforward of like, oh, you you kind of just state what you think when you think something, but I wonder if you might give someone- <laughs> That's so hard. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, it, it seems hard over here. And so I wonder if you might, uh, out of compassion for the knowledge workers of the world, uh, like state something like uh, starting advice for how to, how to start that practice of like thinking in terms of what you call like sharp statements or sharp questions or these thesis statements. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I haven't really written much in the way of advice on this. Uh -huh. Probably I, I should at some point. Um, <clears throat> the way that I work is um, I usually start by writing in um, ephemeral or transient contexts. And that might be like a daily note, like a journal, or um, it might be in a note about a particular um, reading or an event, a conversation, something and, like that. And so it's fair to say like you have probably a number of notes that are exclusively private and then some of them are migrated into your public instance. Yeah, the, the majority of them are, are private probably. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so generally things start transient. That's kind of stretch. Mm -hmm. and, and my stance towards those notes, like I noted about this conversation for instance, is like most likely I'm never gonna look at this note again. So the, the reason to write in it is um, to kind of tickle my own thinking and see like, is there something from this that I can, that I can take? Uh, <laughs> or maybe I can, I can like mm, put enough landmarks on this um, non-map that if, if I kind of come back to this later um, because I noticed a connection, then I'll be able to reconstruct it. Uh, so anyway, it usually starts that way. And I, I'm kind of often, writing in circles about what I think. Um, and, uh, you know, when I have a few paragraphs on a particular idea, 
I'll often, I'll often start another paragraph <laughs> that says something like, uh, okay, so the takeaway here is dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Or like, okay, so what I really think here is uh, something like that. And, and that, that's kind of my heads up that um, uh, I'm trying to do a kind of compression. Hmm. Um, and often I can't do it at that point. Like often it just kind of, it stays there. They're probably three quarters plus of the time. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could abstract this insight, but it, it feels like overfitting. Um, so I'm just going to leave it. Uh, no, and the rest of the time I'll say like, yeah. And in fact, actually that connects to this other conversation I had, you know, into this book I read and whatever. And then I'll be kind of browsing around and pulling things from various places and I'll use them to, uh, to, to kind of make something that might outlive this moment. Uh, and um, that, that's, that's when it's exciting. But, but even then, I mean, usually the title is bad. And so uh, this process of like refining the title it's 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 a really interesting synecdoche for for the whole process of thinking like as my thinking gets clearer that the title gets better and as i understand a space better um like i and i tend to get these noun phrases like you know mnemonic medium uh like mnemonic medium as a noun phrase follows a whole bunch of earlier much smaller things like specific claims like downloaded DEXA spaced repetition cards don't work like that's a specific thing and even that isn't very specific like a better version of that is um you know don't work because they're atomized and and like disconnected from you know particular thing right so we, we could go into more detail but when i collect enough of these mm, more specific claims now i can kind of like bubble them up under some umbrella that, that refers to a whole bunch of things. And this kind of progressive abstraction um, is a really powerful drive in thinking in general. And so the titles uh, are, are almost just like a, um, uh, a very narrow reflection of like what's happening under the surface. Hmm. 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 Yeah, I, I, it reminds me of uh, in high school, they really wanted us to learn like the five paragraph essay system and yeah, like, yeah. uh it took me a long time to figure out that uh you know you were supposed to start with like the thesis at the beginning and it was like i would get to the first paragraph and be like hey, well what's my thesis and just have a bad <laughs> thesis and it's like oh by the time i finished the essay the first draft of it like that's when i knew what the thesis was and that took yeah, me forever yeah. to figure out but it seems like that's kind of what you're doing with your own notes is like just typing what you think and then at the end you're like okay so what's my takeaway as you say pieces <laughs> yes. here and the order is not the order of presentation basically oh yeah yeah and usually i'm rewriting um the, the, the scratch notes don't don't usually make it into anything real <laughs> right 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 fascinating fascinating um yeah i wonder um also just kind of coming back to the the larger research projects around memory of um you know you, you talked a little bit about this but just that something I'm very curious about is like collaboration. It seems like you've worked pretty closely with Michael and I wonder if you've like learned anything about collaboration from working with him or um, any of the other collaborations that you've done, like kind of how you think about collaboration and what makes good collaboration for you. Sure. Yeah, I've, I've been lucky to have some, some really outstanding collaborations. Uh, gosh, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's one of the most rewarding things in life. Um, Definitely. I think the most important thing I've learned, and this is, is proven true for me again and again, is to um, uh, 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 just make as much space as possible for what the collaborator is amazing at. And then when I think I've made enough to make even more, um, like the, the value of working with people who are so much better than you at stuff <laughs> is uh, that when you get out of their way, they'll astonish you. Mm. Um, and I, I think a thing that's hard is to really abdicate control. It can feel like even abdicating contribution you know, if you're in a collaboration, it can feel like, you know, you want to kind of 
you want to contribute to everything. Like you want to, you want to be a part of everything. And it's, it's nice to be along for the ride with everything. Cause like you'll, you'll learn a lot. And, and sometimes you, you can contribute to even to stuff that you aren't great at. But um, I have really loved taking my hands off the reins, like with the writing process with Michael, for instance, you know, he's, he's written several books. Uh, he's a much, much better writer than I am. And um, uh, it's, it's tempting. And I, I remember like reviewing the very first chapter of Quantum Country, like I had all these notes about, you know, like comma placement in sentences, right? Um, that's silly. <laughs> it's very silly. Um, and everything got so much better when, um, yeah, when we engaged at the level of ideas instead, and I just let him be an incredible writer. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much, so much to learn from, from deep expertise. Um, another thing that, that I've learned is that it's very rare that, that these people can actually tell you all that much about what they're doing. Um, this, is, this is the problem of tacit knowledge. It's also the problem of the curse of expertise. Um, so much of it is intuition and instinct, uh, and so much of what can be gained is by watching their, their instincts play. And occasionally asking like, what made you do that? You know, when mm -hmm. they do something that really surprises you, it's like, how did you know to do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they change direction. It's like, what, what made you change direction there? Like you saw something, uh, you can learn a lot from that. But um, <laughs> a common thing is to ask like, oh, do you, know, do, do you have any favorite books that really helped you learn you know, this or that skill? And we'll be kind of like, ah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> well, usually they can recommend things, but it's like, it's, it's just not. Um, yeah, apprenticeship and legitimate peripheral participation are, are the best ways to, to learn things. I, I really do believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, yeah. What, what is the sort of, um, you, you, you talked at first about like kind of getting out of people's way and like, what is that like for you? Like what would the tendency to be for you like to get in someone's way and how do you yourself not get in their way? <clears throat> I think for me, the force which is most active in getting in people's way is a fear that if I don't participate very actively and proactively, uh, that my collaborator will think I am lazy or disengaged. And so I'm, I'm in a sense trying to signal my engagement signal um, like how much I value the, the effort by trying to contribute to something, um, but it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, have to, you have to establish a kind of relationship where, um, you know, someone can go off for a week and do like some really hard intellectual work um, and it has, to, it has to like feel okay that you're not helping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because I, I mean, the temptation when someone is struggling, you know, like I'll ask Michael, like, how's it going today? He's like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like writing is hard, right? Uh, so the temptation is to say like, oh, like maybe, you know, maybe I can help, we can, we can outline together, or I, you know, I can work on the next section or whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's a nice impulse, um, but I, I, for, for me, it, it's, it's often unhelpful. <laughs> Another aspect of your work that I'm really curious about is uh, that you're funded through your Patreon at this point, which mm -hmm. I think is really exciting. I, I, part of the reason I'm interested is I also have a Patreon and uh, have been like working on basically making that my my main source of income. And, oh, great. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, like I, I love people being funded that way. And it feels like a really good model for myself. And I'd just be curious to hear about your experience with that and what that's been like for you and uh, anything sure. you would like to share about that. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I should have. Should have sent it to you beforehand. I actually just wrote uh, a few thousand words, uh, okay. uh, a, a new essay, uh, partially on the subject. Um, I mean, the main thing that it is is surprising. Um, it was Michael who suggested, like, ah, why don't why don't we just start one of these things? Like, if it works, it'll probably take a long time, so we might as well just start it early. And I was like, ah, sounds like a distraction. <laughs> <laughs> seems like a waste like you know it'll be coffee money it doesn't really matter I think he was totally right 
Uh, <laughs> um, he was right in both senses that um, my experience has just been like slow, steady growth for the most part. And it just mm -hmm. like took a long time, took a couple of years to accumulate uh, patrons. And, um, <clears throat> and therefore he was also right uh, in the sense that, that it, it could eventually be um, quite a lot of support. And, and he, he was indexing on a few people that we know who, who do actually support themselves in this way. So we had some prior examples um, and it's nice to become an example myself. Mm -hmm. um, some lessons. Uh, so I have sort of an unusual Patreon. Um, I, usually Patreon is, is a little bit of a tit for tat kind of thing where like sign up and you, you get stuff. So to some extent, like you're, you're paying for secret content or like an extra podcast or whatever that's kind of the nature of the relationship um <clears throat> you know I, like I, I write essays for patrons um most of those end up being public later so the, the the nature of the arrangement is is more it's more like npr like you know fund this because you want more of it mm -hmm. um and and the more that i lean into that that the better i think that things work like in a similar sense to the collaboration I often feel like a kind of obligation to like, you know, perform for my patrons or to like do stuff for them and offer stuff to them. Um, and I think that's mostly misguided. Hmm. Uh, I think I, I do my best work when I forget that they exist. Hmm. Uh, I notice sometimes that I will catch myself thinking like, ah, I want to be able to write about this topic for my patrons. And so I should run this experiment and analyze it so that in a few months, I'll be able to write this. And like, that's terrible, hmm. really. Um, I, I don't want that driving my work at all. Um, I would much rather think about <clears throat> that relationship as just kind of um, byproducts and, and, and kind of offshoots from, from whatever primary work I'm doing. You know, So this month, I spent a bunch of time doing deep analysis of like quantum country reader data. And so um, I had to write a ton in order to, to um, do that work, uh, uh, trying to make sense of it. And fine, like I, I can, I can summarize um, some of that writing in, into an essay for patrons. And that's something they might find interesting, but I, I'm not like writing it for them, but that's really important. In this most recent essay that I published, um, I shared something that uh, is, is like less promising um, that you might find interesting. So I, I've seen very steady growth um, for the past couple of years until kind of mid-2021, and then it leveled off. And this is fine. Like, I, I, I'm okay. Uh, I can pay my bills. Um, so I'm not complaining here. But um, I think it's interesting because I think it says something about the dynamics of Patreon. So if I dig in further, specifically what I can see is that my churn rate, the rate at which people cancel, that rate is constant. Hmm. So that rate is about 2% per month, like always. Um, the thing that changed was the, the incoming rate. And I can correlate that in turn um, as just a simple function of the just number of new visitors to the Patreon like webpage. Hmm. Um, like, so the conversion rate hasn't really changed, right? So what this is saying is that, well, if you want constant growth, uh, of your of your patron like Patreon number or whatever, then then you need constant growth of the like visitors into the top of the funnel, um, and and the reason specifically why it makes sense that that mine had plateaued in 2021 is that um, 2021 for me was like running a lot of experiments which were instructive, uh, but I didn't I didn't publish any like big summative glitzy stuff. So like it makes sense that I wouldn't have a big glut of new visitors to my work. Like the major work that people would see is all like 2020 and earlier. Um, and you'd expect that to have some kind of like tail, you know, kind of tail off in, in the number of visitors it would generate. Um, and so like the consequence of this for a Patreon funded person is that like you, you do need to continually generate um, eyeball getting work in order to grow and even maybe to sustain your numbers. And um, that isn't great. Mm -hmm. one, one, one summary of this that I find pretty interesting is that I have about 650 patrons right now. 
Um, and if I wanted to maintain my current funding levels for a decade with my current really pretty gentle churn levels, um, 1,650 people would need to come and go in the next 10 years. Wow. Okay. Huh. It's interesting that, um, I don't know, I think my quantitative analysis, analysis skills aren't, aren't uh, quite up to the task. So it's interesting to kind of hear the findings that you've found from your own Patreon. And like that, that just makes a lot of sense of like the churn and, and the eyeballs and, and so on and, and how that influences the dynamics of what you work on and, and that kind of thing. And uh, definitely variables to consider on my end as well. So appreciate you sharing that. How does that. it influence you? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, I'm sort of coming out of, uh, you know, I, I, I trained in a monastery for a while and uh, left last year. And um, so now I'm, I call myself like a quasi monk, not really a monk by any traditional standard, but I've been very influenced by that. And um, so I want to be living a life that's based on generosity. And so Patreon feels really appropriate for that of like, I'm not charging for different things. I'm just, if people want to support me, they can. And so I try to make the things that I put out there as freely available as possible. Um, you know, this podcast, blog posts that I do, the guided meditations that I do, uh, all of those things are kind of out there. And I also like to put like a Creative Commons license on them where possible. And so it's like, hey, world, you have this. This is a gift from me to you. And if you would like to yeah. give me a gift, you can. And so I, I yeah. like to just like basically not think about it when possible and uh, just like let people know, hey, this is a thing. If you want to support me, great. If not, no problem. This is freely available anyway. Um, like with loving kindness, for example, the, which is a big focus of mine, like I just want people to practice loving kindness and if they want to support me, great, but the practice is the most yeah. important thing. Yeah. Yeah. That actually brings us, I know um, we've talked about this before, but it seems like it's sort of a shared interest is uh, like you've been developing interest around meditation and kind of like inner inner aspects of some of the dimensions of your work. And I'd be curious to sort of move into talking about that and anything you'd like to kind of compare notes about there. Oh, sure. I, I think you, you could teach me a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I meditated fairly seriously for about seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's been tremendously, tremendously transformative for me along many axes. Um, moving through I guess several disciplines has, has been quite instructive. So I think um, you know, kind of non-dual uh, meditation has, has helped me um, with kind of egoic attachments uh, <laughs> in very uh, useful, uh, meaningful ways. Um, uh, uh, Samatha meditation has, has helped me build the kind of continuous attention that I need to um, do the work that I do. So it, it's uh, practically very useful. It's, it's also just really joyful. It, mm -hmm. it helps me, uh, you know, find, find the joy in, in, in momentary experiences. And then of course, loving kindness meditation um, is, is, is a wonderful source of, of joy and pleasure mm -hmm. and happiness and uh, well-being as, as well. So it, this, is, this has been a, a really wonderful thing for me. I do have a specific uh, question for you along these lines. It's a very mm. naive question. Um, I would love your, your take on, and gosh, what, what, what an awful way to phrase it. I'm going to go ahead and phrase it in, in this way that I know is bad because I, I think, I think it'll be fun. Like I, I could, I could work to, I could work to launder this, oh, feel but free. I think, I think it'll be better this way. Um, what do you think is the marginal value of extended retreats for somebody who already has uh, a consistent and apparently effective daily home practice? Hmm. Um, what does marginal value mean? Yeah, I mean, so like that, that's the part that wants to be laundered, right? So um, let me make it much more specific. So like, let's, let's talk specifically about Metta, for instance. Um, so I can achieve like uh, a giving a, a, a particular degree of say like joy or um, love, um, a scope uh, for 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 the the blessings, for instance. You know, as I try to generalize it to plants and to to insects. You know, perhaps uh, what what I feel might taper off. Um, 
how would those feelings, how might those feelings or those experiences change uh, if I were to move from, you know, half an hour to an hour a day to, uh, to take a couple of weeks solid? Um, what might I experience? Mm -hmm. uh, just for my own learning, I noticed you didn't actually answer the question. Can, can, would you mind just explaining what marginal value is to me? Well, I don't, I don't like the question, and that's why oh. I did something else. Mm. Sure, sure. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm just curious to learn what the phrase means generally. Like it, it seems like. Oh, oh, I, I'm so sorry. I, th I thought you, I thought you were poking on me uh, because it's. Um, no, uh, I just genuinely don't know what that phrase means. Got so. it. Okay, cool. Um, it's it's an unskillful framing. Mm, okay. Um, what marginal value means is so we we might know what value means. So mm. uh, uh, an unskillful meditator might ask, "What's the value of of this particular meditation mm -hmm. session? Mm -hmm. You know, what am I getting out of this?" Uh -huh. um, and <laughs> the marginal value. Um, <clears throat> is saying like, so I've already done a particular amount of meditation or I'm already doing a particular meditation. Mm. So relative to that, if I were to pay this extra cost, what would the Delta be? I see. I see. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's helpful. Thank you. Ideally, you, you see know, how it's ideally, unskillful. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's a fair question. I think it's a fair question. Uh, I think um, I was, yeah, I was getting that sense of it from it, but it's nice to hear you describe it. And it, it makes me realize just as a meta note that I feel like Ideally, in these conversations, like both of us, whoever, me and my interlocutor, like come away learning something new. So here I am learning new things. So thank you. Um, Very good. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I mean, as with many questions, I think the answer is it depends. Uh, of course. Um, Maybe I think, you can illustrate a range. Yeah. I think. Um, so I think there's like kind of a contemporary debate in the circles that I frequent about. Uh, something like, to what extent can meditation be like, okay, so a lot of people in teaching mindfulness and meditation in contemporary Western circles will use metaphors based on say strength training. It's like, oh, you just put in the repetitions and then your mental health gets better and you relax more and you're less stressed. And like, um, well, one that what the benefits are, that's that's kind of poorly framed, I think, anyway, but like to the extent that it is just proportional to repetitions is is contentious. Um, there's I think there's a reason that people compare it to that, because uh, to some extent it is like, yeah, if you put in more hours, you're probably going to get more benefit. On the other hand, some things are more and this is sort of the claim by some folks, um, particularly thinking of meditation stuff here, Mark. Um, it's like he he frames it in terms of like wayfinding or problem solving. And so if if somebody has like a specific problem, then like just throwing more hours at it isn't necessarily the solution. It's like, how do I work right. skillfully with this? So um, it's interesting, actually, because I think in some ways, if someone is at a certain skill level with say loving kindness meditation in particular, I think the, the metaphor actually does apply where like, if especially if you're able to feel loving kindness in your body, then like the more reps, the better. Like, I think more hours is like, you will be happier, you will be more loving, you will be kinder. And so in that specific domain, that's like the thing that I teach is like, yeah, more hours, great. Um, but that's that's a subset of meditation. And also um, it's, it's so contextual, it depends on the person and the methodology and technique. I think um, the way I would frame it maybe is, um, and this is sort of how Shinzen frames it, is like, um, a retreat time is a time to go deeper. And so you can explore a new technique or like, you know, learn something new or try something new, encounter new obstacles and, and, and move through them. And then off of retreat, it's kind of more of like a maintain cycle where it's like, okay, I got this far. Right. I have these skills. I'm going to keep maintaining them and using these skills, but I may or may not actually have the chance to go deeper into it. So um, mm. I think that that fits with like a more, problem solving type approach of like, hey, you might have problems come up on retreat and then you learn how to uh, adjust and adapt to them. So I don't know, it depends on as well on like what somebody's goals are and what they're seeking. I mean, uh, people come into meditation for so many different reasons and uh, what their motivations are is probably gonna uh, make it depend how useful a retreat would be. I think in general, like it's good to go on retreat if you're meditating. If you if you have the chance and you find meditation a valuable part part of your life, like it's it's um, I don't know, it's like a gift. It's a privilege to be able to go and practice and deepen your practice. And um, right, not everyone has that chance. So I think I think generally it's like 
sufficiently valuable to do if, if it's available to you, but it depends. <laughs> yeah. Cool, I appreciate that. I mean, I take retreats pretty regularly mm -hmm. for my work and it's, it's very valuable. I, I find, so I, you know, I, I work uh, at home independently uh, and I have to create all my own structure. <laughs> and so uh, it's, it, it can be very easy to, you know, pay way too much attention to the trees or only see the forest. Uh, mm. you know, it's very, it's very, very easy to, to, to find oneself down the wrong path. Um, and so I, I have to like take myself out of my, my own context um, at least once a quarter and often more often mm. uh, than that. Um, but I haven't yet, uh, usually when I'm doing that, I'm just going somewhere else and, mm. uh, you know, getting away from other people's voices and reading and writing, but I'm not, I'm not practicing meditation. I'm still like, thinking about my work stuff. Um, so it would be interesting to, uh, to, to do, mm. uh, to do that instead. Mm. And there's an interesting question of um, also, you know, in, in which discipline or uh, what exactly would I, would I want to pursue when, when on this retreat? I, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. If you were to do a meditation retreat, like which style or yes. place or teacher. Yeah. I I'm, uh, I haven't quite figured out how to state this, but I'm like increasingly bullish on something of like resonance or um, interest of if you feel drawn to a particular style or teacher, like, um, I mean, it's easy to put a kind of like woo frame on it and it's like, oh, I feel like some connection to this teacher and it's like, oh, I feel really interested and drawn to them. But yeah, I don't know. I think even outside of that, it's um, if something's like actively interesting to you and you're like, yeah, this seems good. That's a right. good sign. And uh, that that's what I would follow more than, more than anything mm -hmm. else of like, Oh, what is the best optimal thing? You know, one thing that's been interesting about my meditation experience and I think is, is maybe unusual is mm. I, I I've listened to uh, teachings and recordings of many, many teachers now. And I don't, I don't actually feel that kind of like attachment and connection and drive to like kind of any of them. Like I'm grateful uh -huh. for all of them. Right? Uh -huh. It all seems good. Thank you, everybody. Uh, but, but there's nobody who's like, wow, like how am I going to study with this person? <laughs> mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, I wonder why that is. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah, that, um, hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I don't think it's, uh, something that happens for everybody or like, I don't know. I think, okay. uh, there's some value to kind of like a post teacher model as well. I don't know. Uh, so if it, if it doesn't call, I don't think there's any, any need for it, you know? Don't get me wrong. I'm sure I would benefit enormously from studying with any of these people. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. There's a lot of great folks out there for sure. Yeah. Hmm. Is there any like, um, I don't know, like you, for example, you sent me a, an excerpt of an essay you wrote recently that, that hasn't been published yet, but it was sort of about uh, the emotional connection that you have to your oh, yeah. work. And um, I'd be curious to hear about that of like your emotional relationship to your work and how that kind of fits into this this stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, it'd be fun to discuss that. It, it has been published now, but it's, it's it's patron only for now. Okay. Uh, probably probably next week I'll, I'll, I'll open it up so, so we, can, we can link to it or something. But um, yeah, so this was a reflection about um, the, the suffering in creative work. So I'll, I'll recap very briefly. It'd be fun to... to to hear your riff on this. I mean, it's a really incredibly pervasive trope that you, you, you like read these memoirs from writers and they just talk about like the suffering, mm -hmm. like the suffering of being at the typewriter. And it's real, like it, uh, I, I thought it was so melodramatic reading this stuff as a teenager and like, no, you know, <laughs> I, I would spend all day, I would spend all day writing 50 words. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it feels terrible. Like you feel, you feel stupid and lazy and, and stuck. Um, and the, sa the same is true as, as a researcher, like, uh, you know, I, I came from tech where like we celebrate shipping stuff and like getting more, you know, make, make the numbers go up and to the right. And, you know, I, I have at the surface level inoculated myself to that stuff. Like, I don't, I don't really endorse it for my own, you know, worldview or goals, but, um, you know, when a month goes by and I'm still, I still feel just as confused as I was a month earlier. And like, I don't really have, you know, answers or progress to show, um, that feels bad. You know, you feel unqualified, feel, uh, feel impotent. And, um, and like, usually the way the story goes is like, well, it's all okay. Because like, we're all doing this because of how amazing it feels when you actually like reach the, 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 the wonder of discovery <laughs> or, mm. you know, you, uh, the expressive joy of like, uh, um, uh, just, just finding the right word. 
but um, yeah, in, in increasingly, I, I find that it, it doesn't need to be this way. And I have gotten uh, just um, so, so much happier <clears throat> the more that I've rejected this, this framing, um, even though, of course, much more illustrious writers and thinkers that, than I uh, have, have endorsed uh, this, this framing of like, yeah, you have to get through the suffering. <laughs> <laughs> you have to swallow the bitter pill in order to get the uh, the, the wonders of creativity. Um, I, I find increasingly that I can successfully reject it um, hmm. and, and both decrease the suffering by by interrogating and, and feeling into um, its sources and, and also increase the the kind of latent joy from from the doing, from the ongoing progress, the process rather than um, relying on on outcomes and goals. Um, and that, that has been a, a truly delightful transformation. What helped you facilitate that shift to, to not sort of suffering during the creative process? Oh, so many things, uh, like, like, like many things in life, you know, it kind of comes from many directions. Uh, a thousand complaining conversations with other creative friends, mm. uh, you know, dozens of, of books that, that write on this topic on any of the sides, um, of course, meditation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for instance, um, one way that I began to reduce the suffering associated with this uh, was through non-dual meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that helped me um, uh, uh, not identify with those sensations. It, it, didn't, um, it didn't change the frequency of those sensations necessarily, but um, it made them not suffering, uh, not mm -hmm. cause suffering, mm -hmm. which is nice. Um, and then um, uh, relatedly, I mean, Samatha style meditation, uh, I found very helpful for experiencing the joy in each moment, um, getting that kind of concentrative, you know, s single point attention um, is, is very joyful. Mm. Uh, so long as you, you know, don't let yourself um, get, get drawn afield by <laughs> these, these other things. Um, but then, I mean, to, to, I guess, cause the, um, cause the negative thoughts not to occur is kind of a different work stream mm -hmm. for me. Um, that that required kind of you know like rooting out various false beliefs and you know kind of addressing subtle traumas. Um, loving kindness helped with mm -hmm. this, but much more it was kind of just digging into with the therapist and with the coach, like uh, where actually do these feelings come from? Like what what am I afraid is going to happen? if I just let this take as long as it's going to take. Uh, and like, you know, for, for me, the answers are, are often social there. Um, <clears throat> like others will think that I'm incapable and bad and not doing enough and not good enough. And their love for me is contingent, right? It's contingent on performance. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore I will not be accepted uh, into the community and I, I will not belong. And I will be, you know, alone and unloved. Um, is kind of like the procession of thoughts, which, which I don't, of course, endorse. Um, I don't actually think that's true, um, but there's some part of me that thinks that's true. So uh, <laughs> I have had to work, work through that um, and, uh, you know, continue to, continue to work through that. But I, I suspect that many you know, writers, researchers, creatives, whatever, who, who are experiencing that kind of suffering, like there, there's, there's some kind of generator that sounds a bit like what I described. You know, it may not be social, it may be monetary, for instance, or, or it may be um, uh, about the, the identity they've formed and like, threats to that identity and things like that. But I, I suspect that there's something like that going on um, for, for most people who have these feelings. I, I'm curious, like, are these feelings familiar to you, I, either presently or before, <laughs> your, uh, before your studies? Uh -huh. Right, right. Um, hmm. I definitely have experienced stuff like that. I think I've been, and, and certainly all kinds of generally psychological difficulties, but I think I've been uh, somewhat um, privileged in being not free from them, but like less subject to them. And I think, um, yeah, it's interesting because I, I feel like, um, well, at least to me, it seems like there's there's a few components here of like, one, a lot of the people that I see struggling with this kind of thing, um, it seems to me, I don't know, it's like a judgment about someone else's life, but it seems to me that there are a lot of people doing work 
that they don't believe in or um, don't enjoy or don't resonate with, or yeah. um, even worse that they think is unethical or it is unethical, yes. but they don't notice that or yes. repress it. Uh, yes. That's a big problem. <laughs> um, a second one, yeah, like I think um, there are various, all kinds of psychological blockages that can come up that are difficult. And, you know, I think in this respect, I've been, well, so yeah, I've been privileged in the first respect of like, I haven't worked a job that I've hated or something in years, you know, uh, right, I've, right. I've been aligned with the work that I do um, for, for years. So that's been a privilege. And then from a second one, it's like, I have a lot of tools internally at this point to kind of work with psychological difficulties. And then, um, you know, from a third perspective, also, also kind of privileged here, I think, um, you know, there's sort of recently a, a fair number of people like knocking on different productivity tools and gurus and stuff, but I've personally found that stuff like so helpful and like having those skills for me at least, um, almost obviates a lot of the problems that come up of like, for example, I never, I never face a genuinely blank page because I've already said things before and have good notes in lots of places about the things that I might want to write about. And so because I have good productivity systems in place, like a lot of the kinds of generators objectively of these problems, like don't arise for me. So mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. like having work that I like and having a lot of psychological <laughs> tools internally and like having good productiv productivity scaffolding, it's like, Mm. I, I, I sort of sidestep a lot of these problems for one of, one of the other reasons. And um, that's delightful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Your first point is so interesting. I wasn't even thinking about that. But when I, when I wrote this, when I was thinking about it, because of course you're right, like the vast majority of people who are feeling this, like they're just doing stuff they hate. And it's so interesting that this stuff persists for people who rearrange their lives, you know, for, to pursue their dreams. It's like, I've always wanted to be a writer. <laughs> right. Like, you know, right. I, I, I saved up enough and like I quit my job and like, I moved to the countryside. So my cost of living would go down. And you know, I'm going to be a writer. Isn't this wonderful? Like I've had my <laughs> dream and now like I hate it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that would fall under bucket number two or number three. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. Right. Right. I'll, and probably, probably number two. But, um, but you know, that, that's one of the points is like if, if you have done the inner, psychological work and you're doing work externally that's actually aligned and, and importantly ethical not just that you enjoy but I think is I think if it's unethical that has sort of psychic costs as well yes. but yes. um if you have both of those in place then like good productivity tools make a lot of sense to have like sure. to have yeah. a to-do list or like notes yeah. that you take for example uh yeah. and, and a lot of people actually just don't have good infrastructure on that kind of stuff so um mm -hmm. yeah I think that anyway that I think to summarize, I think I've had a lot of privilege to avoid this kind of problem uh, for That's one great. of the other reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So what, what, is, what does your practice look like now that you are a, uh, I guess, an ex semi monk? Uh, yeah. <laughs> ex is maybe not the right word, but, but you're, you're no longer, um, I, I guess, um, within the monastery. Yeah. The, the pithy phrase I've uh, come up with that's just kind of fun, it's fun to say, is uh, extremely online, uh, one, uh, quasi monk wandering on pilgr indefinite pilgrimage for the benefit of all beings. <laughs> all right, cool, great. <laughs> which, is, which is fun. I think it, anyway, it's, it's kind of, to me, it's amusing to like juxtapose extremely online with, uh, with quasi monk and anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, what is my practice like? So the two things I do every day without fail are uh, standing meditation and Tai Chi. Uh, I spent a lot of last year learning a Tai Chi form and have been really enjoying that. And um, the standing meditation has been has been uh, kind of a, a better default for me than sitting med meditation for a variety of reasons. So those those are the two that I do, and then um, I do a lot of loving kindness uh, kind of throughout the day or as needed, and then um, certainly at, at least once a week with my guided sits. And um, and then there's there's a whole suite of various techniques or methods that I use kind of as needed or as I'm curious about them or so on that um, that's all over the place. I mean, just lots of different things that I've learned from that I'll kind of deploy as needed. Yeah. And so when you say standing meditation, you don't mean walking, you mean standing in place? I mean, standing in place. Yes, this is, um, it's called uh, Junjuang. It's, um, yeah, it's like standing meditation. There are these specific poses that come from like the Chinese internal martial arts. And um, they basically cause your body to generate a tremendous amount of energy or chi and then huh. 
also relaxation and body awareness. And it's also quite good for your health as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I've been doing that every day for, for quite a while now. Wow, interesting. Yeah, I've, I've never, never tried that. Um, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe I can, I can look up what you said. Could you say the name one more time? Uh, it, well, you can call it standing meditation. The Chinese name is uh, Jun Zhuang with Z's. And um, I have an article about it actually, but- Oh, um, great, okay. It's, it's, um, it's kind of uh, not that well known, but I think it's, it's sort of underrated of, um, especially, especially from the, um, well, one of the reasons I was interested in is, is I was having sort of like physical pain come up a lot and um, standing meditation actually can be quite uncomfortable physically, but it wasn't causing me like injury basically. Uh, it was actually helping with injuries. And then um, I think uh, this aspect of like chi generation or energy generation is, is really quite, it's, it's not really emphasized in Western mindfulness, but like it's, it's a very important part of practice if you're able to like bring up and, and spread energy and it, it takes on a life mm -hmm. of its own. So that's part of why I've been interested in that and, and Tai Chi as well. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Lovely. So, so what guides your, your um, peregrination? <laughs> yeah. Um, ideally, I would kind of decide from stop to stop, but I think I'm currently somewhat plotted out through the summer at this point uh, with a couple of a couple of things to figure out. But yeah, a while ago, I sort of asked about different people that would be willing to host me. And I have a list of like different people that are willing to put me up and it's kind of oh, growing wow, all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's been really, I know people are generous with letting me stay with them. And also it's been, um, you know, I, I think ideally it's, it's really nice both for me and for the other person that we like get to spend time together and like know each other better and, and learn from each other. There's like this peership that happens. That's really nice. And um, wow. Yeah. So basically I, I go uh, where it seems like it would be the most, basically where it would be the most enjoyable for me and the most benefit externally. Like lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about that's sort of near any of the things we've talked about or. Uh, oh gosh. Yeah, right there. I mean, I, I guess, um, can, I mean, you probably you've talked about this a hundred times, but I haven't read about it or heard about it. So mm. can you can you tell me about your your decision to leave monastery? Sure, sure. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about about retreat time, and I think one way to uh, view uh, monastic training is as kind of an extended retreat. And so, you know, usually retreats for lay people are like a week or 10 days or something like that, maybe two weeks or a month if you're lucky or two months even, but it's, it's sort of this short time bound thing. And actually from, from the perspective of, of, of like very deep practice, like a week is like both an incredible gift and an incredible opportunity and a very short amount of time to go deeper into practice. Right. So, right. Um, which is all the more reason to be appreciative of it and, and take every chance you get, I think, but um, but it is a very short period of time and, and, and a monastic training period of say a year or several years or a decade or whatever is, is um, time where, you know, you can really go pretty deep into, into training over lots of retreats and, and just practicing day in and day out. And so um, I actually trained twice at the monastery that I trained at. I had two training periods. The first one was about two years and the second one was about three years. And um, uh yeah, they, they, they both seem to have kind of like a, a um, like a lifespan to them where it's like, okay, this is the end of this training period. And, uh, and then I was curious about going out and, and going into the world and, and learning new things. And, um, you know, yeah, looking back on it now, there's, there's sort of a call to being in the world and, and using my skills mm -hmm. to be of service and also to learn new things and try new things. And so the world is a good place to do that. And the monastery is a good place to kind of deepen in my practice. And there's been kind of a time and a season for each of them. I really like this, this phrase, a call to, to being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it, re it related to something else that kind of surprised me when, when, I, when I was first introduced to your, to your stuff, you know, I was, I was reading your page and, and, and reading about um, you know, all the things that you, you do and reading your articles. And it, there, there was a little like blurb about, about your interests. Uh, and it's like, okay, here's this like semi-monk guy. Uh -huh. And then in, in his list of interests is like marketing. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> you must have like a really different relationship to marketing than most people do. Can mm -hmm. you characterize that? Huh. 
Yeah, yeah. I think um, one of the unusual aspects of the training that I did was that it was focused um, not exclusively on contemplative training, but also on basically leadership training. And the idea was to oh. create people who are uh, deep practitioners who could also say, go start a nonprofit or um, start a company or uh, even okay. start a monastery. And so it's like, it's one thing to go be extremely deep in contemplative practice. And I think I think that's actually highly worthwhile is just to have someone just practicing. <laughs> but um, it's another thing to kind of like throw that person into a boardroom or, uh, you know, a meeting or something like that and have them try to have an impact in the world. And um, it was sort of a skills-based training. And so, you know, when I was there, I was helping to run the nonprofit organization in a variety of roles. And that was kind of the leadership training that I did there and wanted that organization to succeed. And then, you know, I've also for a number of years now had my own projects that I've been interested in doing. And so um, as far as marketing in particular, I think um, I view it as a, as a form of power and power I think is, is neutral. It's not good or bad, but the thing that you use it for really matters. And so from my perspective, um, I think the things that I'm doing are wonderful. I think the things that you're doing are wonderful. That's a big part of this podcast is like kind of giving a chance to showcase different projects that I think are of benefit in a, in a really wide variety of ways, of course. But, um, you know, it's like from that perspective, if there's a good project, whether it's a company or like a, a startup or a nonprofit or just, you know, a new idea or something, it's like, I want people to know about it and I want it to benefit the people that it can benefit. And so marketing, um, as I conceive of it, is like basically like a suite of tools to help the people who can and should know about something that would benefit them know about it. So uh, it's right. like compassionate to tell people about something that would benefit them that they're that they're interested in and it's relevant to their life and so on. And that that precludes a lot of um, sort of traditional marketing tactics, you might say. Um, I, I you know it's very important to me to hold like a stance of ethics around a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of tactics that I've seen that I think are basically unethical, um, but sure you know, I know my ethics and I'm not worried about violating my own ethics. So within those constraints, it's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with telling people about what I'm doing and, and kind of trying to reach as wide an audience as possible that, that was, that's actually relevant and beneficial. Um, I, both for my projects and, and other people's that I think are, are good enough benefit. That's really lovely. I, I, I love the, this notion that, it, that it's actually a kind of compassion. It really, rings true and in fact it, collect, it connects to a, a piece of a classic problem in collective intelligence like if mm. you imagine that you know you want to take all the world's people with all of their their incredible capacity and and ideally it would be great if everyone could could at every moment be kind of working on the thing that would you know make them happiest and, and maybe have the most impact and so there are a lot of these dreams of uh you know systems where you know, maybe somebody who's working on like a drug discovery thing can say like, oh, like I need an expert on like monkeys of this particular kind. Cause like we think this pathway might be something we can investigate. And that person who's an expert on monkeys of this particular kind, like they wake up and, 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 you know, something in, in, in the world, whether it's a computing thing or, or an interpersonal thing, like tells them like, we have great news today. Like you have an opportunity to have like way more impact than, than you normally could doing something you're really excited about. Like, let's connect you to this project. Mm. And then tomorrow will be different. It'll be something else. Mm. Um, and, and so this, this kind of like dream world of like get, getting people's attention and intelligence and creativity kind of applied uh, where, where they would most want it. It really requires a kind of marketing. Mm. Wow, interesting. So, so the general problem is how to like distribute skills and resources from people in like a good way if they're sort of a broad network of people that are working on things and then you're saying that yeah that within a, a dynamic ever-changing system i see i see yeah that makes sense that makes sense yeah i mean um i mean presumably within like a a, a system like a company or a, a a nonprofit or something like people are sort of have alignment around the mission and like yeah we already think for example that k through 12 education is like worth working on so it's like oh we'd be happy to have you your help over here kind of thing but um because that, that does seem to be a big it's like both um like getting alignment around the like why and the mission of something and then also like yeah just information of like hey there's this project that's happening over here 
Yeah. Right. I mean, a naive kind of thing is like, well, when I was working at Apple, my awareness of, or like the salience of a whole bunch of other projects that I could be doing, and actually I probably would have enjoyed way more and would have been more uh-huh. impactful. It's like very low. Like I just, I didn't know that these things were options. Mm. And it's not so much that like, you know, in this case, a specific organization needed to market to me, mm-hmm. you know, the Khan uh-huh. Academy needed to market to me and convince me to, to, to go join them. But like, another way to look at this is like causes needed to market to me. Mm. And so you look at like, you know, effective altruists, like they have a very active regime mm. of, of kind of like marketing this cause, like, hey, you tech person, finance person, you know, instead of doing that thing, like you could do this thing. Um, and so, so this is a very general problem of, of creating this awareness of, of the space of possibility in an agency. Totally. I, I am so curious about how that works at like really huge companies, especially like Apple, like how they divide labor and like organize things and uh yeah, that's something I'm very curious about. Well, Apple is mostly command and control. Okay, <laughs> Apple's pretty <yeah>. simple. <laughs> right. 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 But then, I mean, companies like Google are pretty interesting because they're, they're, they're much more bottom up and the engineers have just like a lot of say in what they do and don't hmm. want to do, at least as I understand it. Um, there's a lot of things they can't do, but um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of corralled anarchy um, hmm. that's nevertheless very productive. And, and like, that's beautiful <laughs> interesting mm. way too <laughs> mm. fascinating fascinating well i i would love to talk to you more about this stuff but i am aware of the time and i know you have to go oh, yes, right right. so uh i <laughs> want to honor your time and yeah thank you so oh, much cool. for talking to me today and really enjoyed the conversation and uh, i just appreciate it so much oh likewise thank you for a lovely chat mm.